that there hasn't been much good news coming out of Canberra in the last week, but we received a dose of it yesterday. The former Deputy Prime Minister and National Party leader, John Anderson, has indicated he'll put his name forward to run as a Senate candidate for the National Party at the next federal election. This is an excellent decision for everybody, including those west of the Great Dividing Range. Not, I should say, that John Anderson is saying he should be pre-selected. He's merely offering himself for pre-selection. And this is central to the point I've made often and again yesterday. John Anderson was the Deputy Prime Minister under John Howard. He stepped down as Deputy Prime Minister in 2005. He was 48. We're not so well served with talent that we can allow Paul Keating, Tony Abbott and John Anderson to stay on the sidelines. I'll talk to John Anderson in just a moment, but without stealing his thunder, and he may be too modest to say this, let me share with you a couple of things he's already said, which will have people cheering from Cape York Peninsula to Wilson's Promontory. That is, unless you're a product of the recent education system, you may not know where either of these is in Australia. John Anderson has said he'd like to see a different tone in federal politics. Quote, we are deeply divided by the poison of identity politics, which so powerfully pits us against one another and so denigrates our past that we feel unworthy and unable to defend the benefits and the values that our forebears fought so hard to secure for us. Fantastic. He called the National Party, quote, the natural home of a sensible mainstream outlook of a Bush pragmatism, which is rooted in traditional Australian values. Now, people are aware of John Anderson's views. He has for some time run a popular website in which he's interviewed leading conservative thinkers from around the world. But this is a very welcome intellectual injection into Australian political life, which often seems to have lost its way. He said he wants to lead cultural change as well as policy initiatives. I quote, he said, I'm deeply concerned by the way we're tearing ourselves apart. We have to learn the good and the bad in our history. But without our history, he said, we are adrift. There is a concerted effort, he says, to delegitimise our past and make it a thing that people would certainly never celebrate, unquote. Well, that is by way of background. Those are views which would be endorsed overwhelmingly by Australians. But is John Anderson fighting with his hands tied behind his back? He joins me. Joins me. I have no idea where John is, but I think he might be on the farm, are you? Good evening to you. Where are you? <laughs> on the farm fighting with technology. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I know. I should say to our viewers, we had a bit of a problem here because John was meant to be on earlier, but we eventually got in there. Congratulations. I understand the children asked you whether you'd be able to cope with the Twitterati. Your response was? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they're right to ask, I've got to say, because it is a concern the way it's used. Uh, but if we're going to say, if people are going to feel intimidated out of offering to serve by the misuse of social media by haters, all of our fears about where our society is going will be confirmed. We've just got to rise above it. We really do. Uh, what, and maybe what, as, what prompted this decision? Sorry? What prompted this decision? Uh, I, I, I feel compelled to find the best platforms I can to argue, I think, essentially two things. You've just encapsulated them. Our biggest problem today is actually, I think, cultural. Um, and they, that cultural division, that tribalism, the poison of identity politics is so constipating our capacity to have a reasoned, evidence-based, respectful debate that can lead to good policy. And then on the policy front, I mean, I, I hardly know where to start, but two things that really concern me. Firstly, we have just got to recognise, and, and look, I'm not criticising the government because they've been saying this too, but coming out of the pandemic, the idea that big government spending magic money forever won't ruin us is nuts. Now, we are standing on the shoulders of reforming governments in the past that set our economy up, put cash in the bank, but we've fired off so many shots in this latest war, if I can use that, uh, that term, with COVID, and before that, the great financial crisis. We've got to put shots back in the, in the locker for the next economic or whatever shock it is that comes our way. And 
to do the two things that really I can't believe that we are not focusing on more, securing our supply chains, including oil, by the way, uh, so that we can guarantee agricultural production, distribution of groceries, all that sort of stuff, and demonstrating to our allies, as well as to those who might have it in for us, that we're serious about defence. Uh, uh, there's been a big step up, but there needs to be a national debate. Just tell me this. Tell me, you told me about a recent survey. I just want you to share that with our viewers because they would understand the conclusions, but they're not widely argued. Yeah, this was in New South Wales. We went out to have a good look at private turning, but very high quality polling uh, uh, a mob. Uh, and uh, we wanted to see what was top of mind and also how people responded to touch button issues. And I was a bit surprised because education, health, and transport stroke roads when I was in, in government were the things that always uh, came up when company people were worried about uh, policies. This time what came out first as a clear winner uh, was the very passionate commitment to the idea that we want our kids to have a high quality education, the three R's, science and history. What is even more remarkable is that number two concern was, can we get the ideology out of our classrooms and then, even uh, keeping in mind COVID, uh, it came to health and, and uh, transport and roads after that, perhaps reflecting actually that a lot of money's been spent on infrastructure and it's, it's beginning to be appreciated and showing out here. You've said things in the past too about the Paris Agreement and asked whether we're going to see massive unpredictability in the power generation sector. Could you amplify those thoughts? Yeah, I think going back to the last election, uh, um, Regardless of where you sit on the climate change debate, when you're not honest with voters and when you don't tell them precisely what the costs in various measures are, you cannot be surprised that the Australian people divide and won't come with you. And it really disturbs me. It's very easy for people on secure jobs in leafy suburbs to say, well, we'll be purer than purer on climate, but we'll pay for it with somebody else's job. It, it goes to this heart of the divisiveness that I think we've got to put aside in the face of the massive challenges that now confront us. And they're internally driven challenges, the way we treat one another, the way we talk, the way we constipate debate. Remember, Alan, the last major reforming piece of legislation that was widely in the end recognised as something the country had to do, it was the GST 21 years ago. Yeah, quite. We now face a plethora of issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. yeah. And yet the answer is to duck and we hope well, the next coming to that, look Coming to that, you spoke at a breakfast for Tony Abbott and in it, at that breakfast you said, quote, there'll always be those who want to silence some of the things that need to be said. That's become a pandemic in itself, hasn't it? Yeah, well, of course, during the 1930s, even Lord Reith of the BBC tried to mm. quieten Winston Churchill and he had to find extraordinary ways to... Uh, use allegory and what have you in his speeches to make the points that he thought were critical as he watched what was happening over the channel. It never pays to silence people. And, in fact, I always think the dumbest thing of all to do is to try and silence your opponents. If you think their ideas won't stand scrutiny, we'll put them out in the sunshine and, 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 and let it do the, uh, the uh, sterilisation, if, you know, if, if, if that's what it needs. Mm -hmm. Don't silence people. It, Good on it you. absolutely binds the place up. On the other hand, I would say we need to be a lot less personal when we're discussing these things. So let's try and go to evidence, facts, and be honest about the debate, which is the trouble, you know, Australia has been stuck on where to go on climate change for a long time, and it's a lot of the problems been the dishonesty at the, at the heart of the debate. Good on you. Those who want change have not been prepared themselves to say what they will put up themselves by way of personal pain and sacrifice. Good on you. Lovely to talk to you. Look, I know we'll take first things first, and the first thing is you're only offering yourself. It's now up to the National Party to determine. So I guess between now and whenever that happens, we won't see much of you. But if you are confirmed as a Senate candidate, we'd look forward to talking to you more often. But thank you. Your entry into the debate and entry into the political scene, re-entry, should I say, is more than welcome. I know tonight, in what you've said, you've given hope to a lot of people. There is room for change, and we need the agents of change. Thank you for your time. Go back to the farm. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> there we are. What do you make of that? What do you make of that? Give me a call, Alan.
at skynews.com.au or 0414 0008 extraordinary stuff.